I'm really excited to be here at ApacheCon. <clears throat> um, it's great to meet some of the community members and, um, and kind of experience what you guys do here at, Apache, uh, at ApacheCon. So um, I know I'm standing between you and the, the beer. Uh, I'm also standing between you and the key signing. So I'm gonna say my piece and then we're gonna get on with the rest of the day. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, my mission for the last three years has been to improve the citizen experience. And I know that could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but for me that means creating citizen opportunities for citizen engagement. Creating ways that people can re-engage with the government that a lot of us has, have become unengaged with uh, over the last few years. So my story begins in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I found a very interesting way to blend my passions. My passion for open source, my passion for civic participation, and my passion for my local community. And that came in the form of the open government and open data movements. Thankfully, open source is at the root of all this. Um, open source is part of my DNA. Uh, I've, been, uh, I've been at Red Hat for over a decade. Um, I, am, I love open source. It's, it's part of my passion. The interesting thing is I get to explain what open source is to a lot of people who are not technical. And when you can see the gears start turning and see the light bulbs going off, that they can understand the power of the open source way, it really, um, really makes me feel good and really makes me feel good that they can understand um, what a popular development model can be applied to other things. So open is better, right? I think almost everyone in, in this room would agree with that. But why is it better? It's because of the um, open source model of participation that we have. And I um, promise you that Allison and I did not coordinate our slides. Uh, we're completely isolated from, from preparing for this, right? So we, we're, we're great with transparency, right? We're transparent with our source code, with our, um, with our bugs, with our features. Um, we give out roadmaps so that people know the direction that the projects are going in. We collaborate. We have a variety of tools for collaboration. Uh, we use GitHub for social programming. Um, we have wikis. Etherpads, we still collaborate over email. It's very effective most of the time. Uh, we collaborate in person at conferences like this. It's all really about participation, right? This is the whole scratching your own itch part, right? This is how a lot of open source projects start. Um, there's a need, um, you find some people that have a similar need and you go for it and you create a project. I'm not getting, there we go. Uh, one of my favorites is rapid prototyping, right? This concept of releasing early, releasing often. Um, the idea that we're contributing code to Rawhide uh, every day. Um, what did someone say earlier this week? Uh, violent feedback loops, right? We, we get almost instantaneous feedback uh, on whether our code is good or bad. Um, another way that I think about this is failing faster, right? If we can fail faster, we can find the code that works, we can find the right path to success. And then we have governance. Um, the idea is that um, the best code will rise to the top. The best ideas will win uh, is, is really fundamental to how a lot of our projects work. And then the secret ingredient to open source is passion. I would imagine that everyone in here is extremely passionate about the projects that they work on, and that's why you do it. Um, sometimes it's great that we get paid to do it, um, but it's, it's also great that we have this, uh, this inner passion that really drives us to um, to provide to our communities. And so transparency creates accountability. Participation, you know, with more eyes, all bugs are shallow, allows us to, um, to innovate faster. And passion creates commitment. This is why open is a better way. I, can, I bundle all these terms together um, in a kind of much like the Apache way, uh, called the open source way. When you think about all the successful pieces of the open source development model, uh, rapid prototyping, participation, community, knowledge sharing, that's the open source way. And when you can take the open source way and apply it to other disciplines, that's really powerful. And so I get to do this every day um, with my job at opensource.com. We, uh, if you're not familiar with us, we're an online publication and community highlighting how the open source way can be applied to different things like business, education, and government. And that's what I'm gonna talk to you today about. Applying the open source way outside of technology, this is a great example of taking what we know from the world of coding and applying it to something that impacts us every day. I would imagine that most of you think government looks like this. You put taxes in and you get services out. 
Governments create roads, they build schools, they um, collect our garbage, our recycling. And a lot of us have, um, feel like we can't influence some of the decisions that our governments make for us. But we can, and I hope I'm going to share some examples of how we can do that today. And again, going back to my mission, changing, uh, improving the citizen experience. This is all about engagement. This is all about how um, we can take things that we know and love every day and influence them uh, with our governments. So I'm gonna start at the federal level here briefly. Uh, when President Obama first took office, um, his administration released the Open Government Initiative. And you'll see I've underlined three key words here, transparency, participation, and collaboration. They should sound very familiar to us. This is a direct play from the open source playbook. I don't have a problem with that, by the way. Um, and I'm really excited that the open government movement is largely based on the principles and philosophy that we know in open source. Last year, the administration um, released the, um, this executive order, which I call the default to open. It basically mandates that any agency that's producing data should produce data um, in an open and machine readable format not only for other agencies to consume, but for us as citizens to consume and for the industry to consume as well. Um, the great examples that you'll hear all the time are the fact that the US government um, um, has the GPS and the weather data available. There are entire ecosystems that have developed around those technologies because they're free and they're open. So I wanna tell you a little bit about my, my personal story and how I got involved. Again, the blending of my three passions. One of the first things that I got to do was an interview with former Raleigh Mayor Charles Meeker. Uh, I went to his office, sat down, and we talked about applying the open source way, the open source philosophy, to a living and breathing city. He talks really fast, and I'm a slow typer, and I didn't have a recorder, but it worked out pretty well. <laughs> I was able to publish this interview on a platform that I have access to, and a weird thing happened after that that I didn't expect. A community started to form around this. I had people contact me and said, Jason, I want to get involved. What are some things that we can do together to improve uh, the citizen experience, to understand how we can take open source and apply it to our city? We started talking about this idea of branding a city as the, how, how, what would an open source city look like? What are the principles uh, of an open source city and what would they, um, how could they impact kind of normal everyday citizens? The catalyst for us was uh, an event called City Camp. It's an international unconference series that's designed to bring open source and technology to local municipalities. So I've uh, run three city camps. I'm actually in the middle of planning a fourth one. I've had the opportunity to attend several city camps across the United States. Uh, I've been to city camps here in Denver, Colorado, in uh, Kansas City, the, both the Kansas cities together, because that's how they do it out there, and uh, Honolulu. Don't ask me how I got my manager to approve that expense report, um, but it was great. So uh, if you're not familiar with, un, um, City Camp is an unconference, and obviously you guys have an unconference tomorrow. But for those uh, unfamiliar with it, it's basically where the organizers plan the place, the time, the logistics, the food, the parking, everything like that. The only thing we don't plan is the agenda. And so we plan the agenda based on the people who show up and participate. The, uh, a group of volunteers came together. These, these people planned the first City Camp in Raleigh. Uh, there's actually been city camps held all over the world, by the way, so it's not just here in the U.S. Um, none of these folks got paid to do it. They're all doing it because they're passionate about our mission and what we want to accomplish. And uh, for basically over the course of 12 weeks, uh, we got together. Uh, we formed different committees. We formed a logistics committee, a speaker committee, a marketing committee, uh, and we planned an event. We planned an unconference. Sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? Um, and this is kind of what it looked like. Um, we... We basically kind of a hybrid model. We had some planned speaking opportunities at the beginning, uh, usually a business panel and a government panel. Uh, they basically kind of gave us the lay of the land, um, told us what was happening in government, what was happening in business, and provided inspiration for the next part, which was the unconference. You know, we're getting together on a Saturday morning, um, getting coffee, getting bagels, and, uh, and everyone's doing their pitches, right? So everyone gets up. Um, who has an idea, they get 60 seconds. And then we, um, you know, this is very low tech. This is construction paper, tape, and markers. People get, they pitch their idea, they, the ideas get voted on, and then we basically make the agenda on the fly, and we proceed. One of the results from our city camp was, uh, was a project called Triangle Wiki. It's based on the open source project Local Wiki, and basically you can think about it as a hyper-local version of Wikipedia. Uh, it 
basically allows people to, do, to share knowledge of their local community, whether it's your favorite restaurant, your favorite running trail, um, or maybe some history that you just don't want to be lost in your area. So we started building community around this idea of, of having a, a regional wiki for the, our area in North Carolina. And this is what our community building looked like. 50 people, two city councilors, our planning director, on a cold February Saturday morning, got together and we basically gave them a Wiki 101 class and empowered them to create pages and to share knowledge. And this is, this is what we did. 600 pages, 100 maps, 100 new photos, in about four hours, with really the only motivation being passion and a food truck that was coming at lunch. <laughs> One of our other successful pieces uh, was an application called Our Greenway. The pitch went something like this, uh, it's basically, uh, Raleigh mom got up, on, uh, got up and made her 60 second pitch and she goes, hey, how many people use the Greenway system here in Raleigh? And the Greenway system in Raleigh is basically our multi-purpose path system that connects all of our parks together. I think there's about 100 miles or so of, of those trails. And you know, about half the room's hands went up. She goes, well, how many people get lost on the Greenway system in Raleigh? And more hands went up the second time because I think people realized that they would probably used a Greenway and they probably got stuck. Right? There's not a lot of signage, so when you get to the end of a trail, it doesn't really tell you, hey, go left 50 feet to get to the next one. The really cool thing about this app is that this was, this, this was born at City Camp. No one came in with this preconceived notion that we were going to build an application that integrated city data, city maps. Um, they also integrated an application called C Click Fix, which I'll talk about shortly, and weather alerts, so that if you're on the trail system, they use the GPS stuff to alert your phone uh, if there's severe weather coming. Now, I doubt that the city of Raleigh would pay a developer to actually code this app. This is a great testament that citizens can come together, leverage data that's available from government, and fulfill their own need without assistance from the government. The cool thing is, is that this app has continued to develop afterwards. They've, uh, after the city camp, they still get together on a frequent basis. They still um, add new features, and they're adding new maps from cities uh, around, the, around the area for us. They're gonna to have to rename it our Greenway to Triangle Greenway or something like that. Okay, so, um, so we've had huge success with City Camp, but we, we needed to evolve it to, to help it to grow and to help it accomplish new things. So in our third year, we rebranded City Camp Raleigh as City Camp North Carolina. We love our city, but we also felt that our state has some other challenges that we could help solve. We also saw that there were some really powerful things happening in the course of a weekend. And we wanted to stretch out those successes throughout the course of the year. So we partnered with an organization called Code for America. Code for America is a nonprofit out of San Francisco, California, whose mission is to basically empower citizens and residents and governments to use technology for community problem solving. They have a couple programs that do this. The first program is a fellowship program. Uh, basically, cities apply for this fellowship program, and they send a team of developers and designers to code an open source app for that city. And I'll give you some examples in a moment. The other program that they have is a brigade program. It's basically a way to organize volunteers to do civic hacking um, at whatever frequency they want to do that in. Our, our areas meet on a monthly basis. Um, there are other areas that meet on a weekly basis. Every Tuesday night, Oakland gets together and they do civic hacking in City Hall at six o'clock. Uh, and there's other places around the US that are doing that as well. So we named our brigade Code for Raleigh. One of the first things we did was we participated in a campaign from Code for America called Race for Reuse. If any of you have been to hackathons before or participated in a campaign like this, a lot of them are trying to produce new applications. Well, the whole purpose of this campaign was to reuse existing open source applications. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Uh, they had selected a bunch of different projects. One of them was Local Wiki. For us, we had already done that, so we checked the box on that. There was another application called Textasin which basically allows governments to do SMS polling with citizens um, to get them engaged on their mobile phone and to gather feedback in a different kind of way. We chose to do the ADOPT application. Uh, ADOPT started in Boston as ADOPT a fire hydrant. Um, why in the world would somebody want to adopt a fire hydrant, you may ask? Apparently, when they snow and get iced on and they're not cleared out, they're not very useful. So, uh, the, city of, uh, the city of Boston was part of this fellowship program, and they coded this adopt a um, fire hydrant, just like you would adopt a road or adopt a highway uh, or adopt a stream for cleaning up purposes. So this adopt -a app went to the city of Chicago where they do adopt sidewalks. Same thing, ice and snow events, they clean them, citizens volunteer to clean them off. 
Uh, it went to Seattle, where they do adopt a storm drain. Apparently, it rains a lot in Seattle. Litter, trash, tree branches get stuck in the drains, and citizens clean them off. It went to Honolulu, where they have uh, adopt a tsunami siren, where citizens help out on a monthly basis to make sure that the tsunami sirens are, are audible and working, and that they have batteries, because apparently people steal batteries out of these things in Hawaii, because they're valuable. So we did adopt a bus shelter. I saw an opportunity where the city of Raleigh um, basically put out a pen and paper program for adopting bus shelters. Same thing, citizens can uh, basically call the city and say, hey, I want to uh, adopt bus shelter 122. Uh, they basically just clean it up once a month, make sure it's tidy, make sure it looks good for the, the users of the bus shelter. So uh, our, our brigade got together with Public Works um, and we pitched the idea. I said, hey, we want to put a technical front end on this, on this program that you just launched. And we did. It basically took us about two weeks to get the code up and running and to get, all the, um, get some clean, sanitized data into the, uh, into the program. We spent the rest of our time marketing the effort because nobody in the world knows that you can adopt a bus shelter in the city of Raleigh. Uh, one success point for us was we actually doubled the number of uh, adoptions um, during our campaign. But it's not all sunshine and roses here. We, um, we actually hit some road bumps along the way. So after the campaign, we, we had some issues. Um, we had to figure out some challenges. We had to figure out who's gonna update this code after we're done, because we're just a group of volunteers that was getting this application stood up. Um, we had some of those handoff issues of what happens when there's a new bus shelter? Who's gonna actually physically enter that into the system? So we're working at those details now, but I mentioned that in case any of you get involved with this to start thinking um, kind of on the enterprise level and some of these things you're gonna have to do if you're volunteering um, with technology like this. So we're really friendly in Raleigh. Um, we helped form two other brigades in our area, one in the town of Cary and one in the city of Durham. We meet on a monthly basis um, and, the, and the captains, uh, basically we do a Google Hangout and we share what's happening in our brigades. Uh, we also share a joint meetup page so that anyone in the triangle um, can figure out uh, what's happening with, uh, with our division. We call it a division if you uh, have any military background. Um, and, and, and we're basically working collaboratively as a region to make sure we're not duplicating efforts or that we're enhancing existing efforts for each brigade there. So if you're interested in this stuff, there are brigades all over the US. In fact, there are new brigades forming all over the world. There's a code for Poland. There's a code for Japan. Uh, if you're inspired by this, see if there's a, um, a brigade in your area and see how you can join and see how you can help. Um, and if you're really inspired and there's not one in your area, maybe you want to be that catalyst and get that community going. So that's a little bit about what's happening on the citizen side. That's kind of all volunteer work that we're doing as a brigade, as city camp organizers. I want to walk you through a few things that the city of Raleigh has been working on as well. One of the first apps they deployed is called C Click Fix. It's basically a bug tracking tool for city infrastructure. It uses the Open311 protocol that allows citizens to report non-emergency issues to the city. Think things like potholes, graffiti, um, broken park bench, something that's not kind of key to the infrastructure. Um, I love the transparency aspect of it. Uh, I love the fact that you don't have to memorize a phone number, figure out which department you need to call. You basically submit something through the web or through your mobile device. The city takes it and they triage it on the back end. They figure out which department it goes to. Um, they acknowledge that your, that your um, issue has been accepted and they um, keep it updated as you go. You can also vote up separate things. And one of my favorite features is you can actually set um, uh, set a, a block area so that if you just care about your little part of the city, you can get alerts for when something's happening in that section. In February 2012, they passed an open government resolution. And this accomplished two things. It basically said that, uh, it basically put open source software on an equal playing field with proprietary software. It didn't mandate it, and that's okay, but it said that we prefer to use open source software. The second thing that it did is that it basically created a mandate for uh, an open data portal. The best part about this, it wasn't just a kind of a pen and paper resolution, rah, rah, we're gonna be open government. It actually provided a roadmap on steps that they, the city was going to take in order to accomplish these, um, these, I, I, these ideas. And so they launched Open Raleigh. It's basically a web page slash portal where it's um, highlighting all the different open source and open data things happening in the city. They launched an application called My Raleigh Ideas. It's a solution from a company called Granicus that allows citizens to participate collaboratively online. 
They can give feedback on things like the budget process or, or the actual budget and how that's being allocated. Um, street corridor studies, and as you can see on the screenshot here, the open data project. The city of Raleigh was very strategic when they did their open data initiative. They didn't just say, let's open source all the data. They asked developers, they asked citizens, they asked businesses, what data do you care about? So the first version of our open data portal looks something like this. People really care about transit data, crime data, uh, and they found that in our area, we were really concerned with permit data and, um, and trail areas. So these are kind of um, some of the things that, that they worked on initially. The best part about this is the, the visualization component of it. I don't know about you, but I cannot stand reading 60 pages of PDFs of tabulated data. I'd much rather have a pretty map with colors on it that I can actually show to someone. So last month they launched um, the, the full, that, that was the previous one was the beta version. This is actually the full version that they have now. It's based on a solution from a company called Socrata out of Seattle, Washington. Um, not fully open source, but open core, so close enough for the needs of this. Um, they also have open APIs. The advantage of this is it's a pretty turnkey solution, right? They can come in to any city government or any government for that matter and put up, stand up the platform and start entering data and voila, you've got an open data platform. If you're interested in the open source alternative to this, uh, there's a project called CKAN, C-K-A-N, that um, probably takes a little bit more ramp up time but does provide a full um, open source stack. So I didn't get to talk about all these initiatives today but the point I wanna make here is that what seemed like what started with City Camp is all attributing to this concept of an open source city and helping us define what an open source city could be. As with any movement, storytelling is a very important part of it, whether it's open source, open government, or open data. And so I decided um, to share this story. So I'm sharing the story with you today, but I also wrote it down for everyone. And uh, I wrote a book called The Foundation for an Open Source City. It basically is designed for anyone who doesn't know anything about open source. Um, it defines open source, defines open data, defines open government in plain English. Um, it's designed for elected officials who need to know what open source is so that they can make decisions uh, and help the IT department advance government through open source. And so in the book, I outline five elements of an open source city. The first one is about culture and participation. Luckily, in Raleigh, in the Triangle area, we have a lot of active citizens who, are, who want to be involved and who want to find out ways that they can influence and change government. Not from a lobbying perspective, but more from, uh, from a fact that they just want to participate. Then I get into some of the policies, and I separate out the government and the data policies because they don't have to come together, they don't have to um, come one after the other. If there's a, an institution out there that's really not interested in doing the open source procurement piece of it yet, maybe they wanna start with open data and maybe seeing the benefits of having open data and the philosophy of that can help them get to an open government policy. And then they're supporting user groups and conferences. I'm sure that many of you go to meetups uh, several nights a week, several nights a month. Having businesses and organizations support those meetups is really important. We need places to meet, we need tables, chairs, Wi-Fi. It'd be great if we had some free food. Um, for our meetups. And supporting that in, in larger conferences is really important um, to having an open source city. And then if you want to get the attention of any elected official, you can ring the economic development bell. Hey, elected official, all this open source and open data stuff can actually create jobs. And there's a lot of, um, obviously a lot of us have jobs because of this, but um, from open source, but it's great that you can actually prove that there are ecosystems that will develop around open government and open data initiatives. So what I wanna leave you with today is that we all have an opportunity to influence our government. This concept of being a citizen CIO. We may, we may not be able to dictate what software our cities use, but we can sure as hell influence what they use. And we can keep being that squeaky wheel to say, why aren't we using open source yet? Why aren't we using open data yet? And there's an opportunity for us to, to change the game. And then lastly, Basically, the, the mission is for, you know, you guys are changing the world already with Apache, but you have an opportunity to change the world in a different way. And if you're not into the civic hacking thing, look for other opportunities. Um, there's a lot of opportunity in, in the open health space. There's a lot of opportunity in education. We can take what we know from open source and the open source philosophy and apply it to other areas that affect our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'll end with that and basically just challenge you to help me open source all the cities. So thank you.
And uh, I'm gonna stick around. I've got a few copies of my book if you're interested in that. Um, I'll hang out at the reception. I'd, I would love to talk about this stuff. So um, if you wanna continue the conversation, I'll be here this evening and I would love to, uh, to chat about it with, with you. So thanks, Rich. <laughs>